Today's message from Rev. Savannah Riker was recorded June 19, 2016, and while Rev. Christian Sorensen was out of town. This message is titled, Rising Strong, subtitled, The Grace is in the Storm. The music at the end of today's message is from Dominique Tony and her father, Kevin Tony, who were the guest artists today. Dominique's music can be found at dominiquetony.com and Kevin's at kevintony.com. And Tony is spelled T-O-N-E-Y. Come visit us at seasidecenter.org or join us in Encinitas, California sometime, where great music, a spirited message, and a joyful, loving, vibrant community always await your presence. Feel the joy, feel the peace, and the comfort of home, cause all are welcome here, yes all. has actually been part of Seaside for the last year or so. She's been on our ministerial staff. We haven't had the opportunity to see her much because she does a lot of work out in, out in the world. And she now has moved on to a permanent uh, location up in Oakland, but she actually drove down yesterday or the day before the 10 hours to come be with us today. She's also offering an incredible workshop after her talk today. She'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I just want to introduce you to her and tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Reverend Savannah Riker started her spiritual path at 16 years of age with Centers for Spiritual Living. She was a natural leader and pioneer in our youth movement for many years, speaking and facilitating workshops and traveling the U.S., and talking about the importance and the power of youth in the world. She has served on various youth leadership councils and committees for over 15 years. So let's see, 15 plus 16 is... (laughs) Not sure, but maybe 31. Um, She has been actively involved with with the Tenemos Self-Realization Center in the Ukraine as a speaker and a young adult facilitator and a guest teacher for the last 11 years. She lived in Egypt for tw- in 2012 during the revolution for eight months, pursuing her passion for global ministry. Savannah recently received her master's degree in consciousness, congratulations, with the Holmes Institute in Denver, and is currently the youngest minister in our movement. She's, she was on the cover. Thank you. Awesome. She was on the cover of our very own Science of Mind magazine in February of 2015. And her article, The Sacred Amidst the Shadows, is featured. Savannah is the newest staff minister at the historic Oakland Center for Spiritual Living. Her passion is to be a bridge amongst people of diverse cultures and religions globally, inspiring social change, tools for development, and the evolution of love consciousness on the planet. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Seaside. I've always wanted to say that since I was 16 years old. Christian finally gave me the platform. He has known me for half of my life. Um, I was saying in the earlier service that uh, he is probably one of the big reasons I, other than my calling, of course, decided to step into ministry. We were sitting at our Silomar conference in Monterey, California, and I said, you know, I just don't know if I'm ready, the timing, it's so many years. And he said, just take one class, just get your feet wet. And I did, and then four or five years later, here we are. So I just want to thank uh, Reverend Christian for all of his support over so, so many years of youth ministry and this whole path um, and calling, and also this community for housing my letter of call for this long. You've been so generous and and wonderful, so thank you. Uh, My topic today is called The Grace is in the Storm. And, you know, I decided this topic a few months ago, and I always find it fascinating how it's always very relevant to the time that we live in and to what's going on in my own life experience and in the world. And 
It was very fitting uh, driving here. Uh, 10 hours uh, in traffic and everything on Friday, and I started to realize that I was coming down with a, an illness, and I'd never get sick. And so as I was preparing this talk, it was really just uh, me, me finding the grace and the surrender in stopping and slowing down and the importance of self-care and what that means. And so uh, I know grace is with me through my own storm in this moment, uh, so I want to recognize all the fathers in the room. If you are a father or have served as the role of father, would you please stand? I would love to honor you. Yes. Wow. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for the presence that you are in so many people's lives. I'm grateful. And, um, you know, this week has been a rough week for many people, myself included. And it's shaken the core of our LGBTQ community in a really deep and profound way. It's shaken so many of us to see what's uh, been going on. And so we as a spiritual community, we accept and include all people. We are an inclusive community. We accept all walks of life and all religious diversities and orientations. And so I just want to say that we honor you and we acknowledge you, we love you, and we mourn and we grieve with you. I was thinking about putting this talk to get together and what the word grace means to me, and the beautiful song, Amazing Grace, came into my awareness. I had the incredible opportunity at 16 years of age, I was by the bedside of my grandmother as she was making her transition, and something within me knew that it was okay especially being brought up in this teaching of knowing eternal life and the eternality, the immortality of life. And yet, she loved this song. She used to go to the uh, African-American uh, spiritual churches in the South as a young girl and listen to the soulful music and be fed by it. And so I just want to play a little bit of it for you now in memory of all those this week and just for you to take in for yourself. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but song gets me every time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. I once was lost, but now am found. T'was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Hmm. I don't know how many of you know the story of Amazing Grace, but it was written by a man by the name of John Newton. And at the beginning of his life and in his history, he wasn't the most amazing man. He was born in uh, London on July 24th, 1725. He was the son of a commander, and he went on his first sail at 11 years old. He became a man of war and service, and later found that the conditions on board the ship were so intolerable that he deserted but was soon recaptured, and he was publicly flogged and demoted to a common seaman. He then uh, went to own his own ship, and it was a slave ship where he sailed to Sierra Leone and became the servant of a slave trader. He was badly abused there, and he really had no religious background. He really didn't believe in God. And one night, as he was violently steering his ship through the rough waters, he experienced what he calls his great deliverance. He felt that the ship was going to sink, and so he cried out to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on us. And in that moment, he felt that God was 
providing him grace. That grace was on his side. He started to believe, and then he became a Christian after that. In thinking of this word grace, I often have asked this week particularly, how do we rely on grace to carry us through the darkest, the roughest, the most challenging times? Ernest Holmes says that grace is love in action. It is the undeniable full acceptance of the law of good. It is the givingness of spirit to its creation, and it's not a special law, but a specialized one. Grace is, but we need to recognize it. It is not something God imposed upon us, but is the logical result of the correct acceptance of life. It is of the correct relationship to spirit. We are saved by grace to the extent that we believe in, accept, and see to embody the law of good. The Centers for Spiritual Living organization has uh, a vision of a world that works for everyone. And they've embarked on this incredible monthly theme. And the theme for this month is is the freedom from discord. And in Ernest Holmes, what we believe statements... He says, we believe the emancipation uh, of the human from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. And so how do we navigate these waters in the midst of turmoil and change and uncertainty? You know, the world would have us believe, the world of effect would have us believe that we are separate, that we are in lack, that we don't have enough, that there's not enough good to go around, that there's not enough for any of us, that we all should be afraid of everything outside of ourselves. But grace tells us something different. Grace tells us to believe in good, that to believe and to have faith that there is something greater than we are, that we can use, that we have the power that we have the power to co-create with this powerful presence that lives within each and every single one of us to bring forth more joy and more love and more good and more wisdom into the world and on the planet. But you know, the media and the political sphere is so tempting. And they have so many of us living in fear. And you know, some of my colleagues and I have been talking about you know, how to address this issue and what it seems to me that is happening is that the shadow is finally surfacing, that everything unlike the joy and the love and the the, uh, unity that we seek is needing to surface for us to heal as a country and also as individuals. But that work starts within each one of us. Collectively, it happens by doing the work individually, by doing the inner work. And so what we see outside in the world of effect is just the mirror, it's just the... The, um, the world unapologetically saying we need to look at this stuff. And so we, we choose love. And in choosing love and in choosing joy, then all the things unlike that surface for us to grow. There's also this word that comes to me that is used often in our world, and it's the, the word of them always about them. And so I want to invite us back into the space of I and we. We are one. We are connected. We come from this one source, this one life. What is mine to do? And so how do I rely on grace? Well, the first thing that comes to me is we get still. I get still. I pause and I remember the truth of who and whose I am this infinite divine expression of love itself that each one of us are. There's a time for pause. There's a time for spiritual practice. There's a time for us to ask ourselves, what is mine to do and to be in the midst of all of this? In 1 Corinthians, I love this. It says, there but for the grace of God I go. There but for the grace of God I go. The writer Anne Lamott says, I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. Back in 2012, I was living in the midst of a revolution in Egypt during the Arab Spring, and there was a huge uprising. And it was there in the aftermath of it, thank goodness. But that 
brought out so many gifts in my life, such a rich experience and such a scary experience at the same time. And there were many moments of, of craziness where I just felt I was going crazy and I could barely leave my apartment and I was being followed and it was just so intense and everything in me was praying that the heaviness be lifted, that the grace carry me, that there was something and some reason that I was put in the midst of this place at this time in human history to be the light and to be the love and to... to to know more of myself and my relationship with God. And that's exactly what it did, and it was not uh, uh, apologetic whatsoever. I realized how many distractions I had living in this country, and I realized that it stripped me away from all of my comforts. And it forced me to look at the things about myself I didn't like, and it forced me to look at the world and see what is out picturing in the world, and what am I doing in my own spiritual practice, in my own Uh, sphere of cultivating this relationship with the divine, how am I being uh, a servant in the world for goodness, for love, for peace? But you know, a grace carried me. And there were moments where I would wake up and go out and say, okay, I'm going to look at one thing today and find one thing that is beautiful today. So if you can look at your own life now and say, okay, I'm going to make it a goal to see one thing beautiful about the world today and about my life today. I'm going to be grateful for something today. And that requires our listening, our deep listening, and our deep stillness. It also, grace also comes when we remember the truth of who we are. I often say the Father and I are one. You can use whatever words you like, love, spirit, God, infinite intelligence, universe, whatever works for you, the Father and I are one. And so I can do all things through that. I can be all things through that. I was asked by Reverend Barbara Leger from our Timonos community in Ukraine a year and a half or so ago if I would take a journey to Ukraine, back to Ukraine, um, to fill in for her for a peace conference. And I said to her, you know, Barbara, that's like in five days. And she said, I know, but I have an emergency. I can't be there. You know the culture. You know the language. Could you please just, you know, fill in for me? I said, well, Barbara, you do know what's going on there, right? There's like a revolution happening. And she goes, yeah, but you're the perfect person to do it. (laughs) And so, you know, when you just get that intuition of like you're supposed to do something and you're like, really, no, I really don't want to do that. It was one of those things where I said yes, and I had no idea what I was jumping into because of all the many years I've been to Ukraine working with her community, I had no idea what to expect on the ground there. And so I get myself up to the gate at SFO, and I've got my bags ready, and here we go. And the gate checker looks at my itinerary. He looks down at it, and he sees that I'm flying into Kiev. And he looks up at me, and he says, are you sure you want to go there? (laughs) He said, I am so sure. I'm ready, I'm going, I'm on the plane. So I get myself to Switzerland. And, you know, by that point, you're kind of delirious because you've been traveling all night and you can't think straight. You have at least five more hours until you hit the ground. And when I got on the plane, I realized that it was half empty. There was nobody going to Ukraine. (laughs) And so you can imagine there was this panic that started to set in of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I, there's no turning back. I'm on the plane. And so I started creating all these stories in my mind of what was going to happen, and they're going to shoot it down just like they did in eastern Ukraine, and it's going to be this horrible thing. And then I was called back to my mantra. The one thing that I remember when I can't remember anything else of my teaching and my training is this inner knowing of there is only one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is my life now. There's only one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is my life now. And I continued to say it over and over and over again until I was calm, there was a peacefulness inside. And I get to, the, to Ukraine and I'm greeted by some dear friends and they take me to this conference site off-site. And we start the peace conference. And I keep questioning, what am I doing here? You know, this is just, this is just crazy. What is my purpose here? And on one of the evenings there, I was leading this nurturing process. And it's a process that our teens at our teen camps love because they get to touch each other and they love the contact and all of that. And so I thought, okay, 
I'm going to bring this to Ukraine. And it's a process of just giving and receiving love, you just through hugs and gentle touch. And there were candles all out on the ground. And so we were doing this process, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this group of young like, people, just people walking towards me, and these little kids, these little ones, just run into the space with their arms down, their eyes closed, fully participating. And I was like, who are these people? What are they doing? This is a public event. You know, what if we get in trouble? And what I found out later is that they were, they were housed there as Ukrainian refugees who had been displaced from eastern Ukraine. So I got to sit with them and talk about their stories and their stories of struggle and hardship and all those things. And so then I really got to ask myself the question, were you meant to be here, Savannah? Grace has carried me through this whole experience. And grace carries us through all of our experiences. We, we must let it in and we must surrender to it. We must know that there is something greater, that there is a goodness in the universe, that there is a goodness in our life even when we can't see it. I got to see it that day. Ernest Hemingway says that courage is grace under pressure. <laughs> courage is grace under pressure. That is so true of my life. We also find grace in radical self-care. How many of us are so busy always taking care of everyone else? I know, nobody wants to raise their hand. Always so good at taking care of everything and everyone else, wanting to please, wanting to accommodate, and yet we forget our own body temple, our own selves. If anything, this illness has has helped me re-establish my intention for self-care. When we honor and love ourselves, then the beloved can come. When we honor and love ourselves, then the perfect job and the perfect situation can come. When we love and honor ourselves, then our health and our vitality and our energy boosts us and and enlivens us to be better. And so loving ourselves and, and finding the opportunity in the situations that look dark. Finding the gift. There were so many gifts that I look back now and see of my time living in Egypt, even when it was so dark around me, I look back and think, wow, I got a magazine cover and a career and all these incredible things that would not have happened had I not gone through the journey of the dark night of the soul. And it was really heavy. It was really scary. And so it's about loving. It's about loving. It's about seeing the opportunity, seeing uh, the good in whatever situation you're in, even if it's small, baby step. Margaret Mead, I love this quote, I'm sure you've heard it. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So to continue this story about John Newton, because I was really hopeful that he had a good ending, um... 34 years after the slave trade, he finally broke his silence about his involvement with the ships, and he apologized, reflecting on his humiliation for what he was involved in, realizing that it was a horrible uh, mistake. He later became an ally with a man by the name of William Wilberforce, who was also an abolitionist, and they started a campaign to abolish the African slave trade. And he lived to see the Slave Trade Act of 1807 to abolish the African slave trade. And so his story is the story of how we can transform our bias and our prejudice, our judgments, and our our separation, feelings of separation into healing and forgiveness and love. It's a story about how love is the only thing that matters truly. I've heard it often on social media lately, love is love. Well, yes, because love is the essence of all that we are. It is what we're here to do and to be. It's just love. And so I want to close now with a poem that was written in honor and memory of the victims of this week, of the souls that we lost this week. And I think it's also relevant for all of us. It was read at a a pride Jewish, Seder, interfaith kind of um, gathering with all these various religions present. 
It says, teach us to listen to the silence posed by unanswerable questions, to the silence imposed by the rupture of safety, and to that most frightening silence when we can no longer find you anywhere. Help us to remember when the memory is too distant and when the memory is too fresh, when the memory is too painful and when the memory is too dull, when the memory is too horrible and when the memory is too mundane and when we cannot remember, remember for us. Inspire us to act with extraordinary courage in ordinary times, with ordinary goodness in extraordinary crisis, and with unbounded imagination that dares to risk the possibility of hope. Teach us, help us, and inspire us to listen, to remember, and to act, and never to quit. Amen. So we just remember that grace finds us in the stillness. We get still. We remember to care for ourselves and we remember that the Father and I are one, that we are one, that we are connected to something so, so magnificent that is simply calling us to say yes to ourselves so that we can embrace it and embody it, so that we can express it. Only we can do that in our own unique way. And so let us just go into prayer now. Closing the eyes. Taking a deep breath. Just giving thanks for the power and the presence of life itself. For this infinite presence, for this God of my understanding, for this divine wisdom that so loved itself that it manifested as my very life and as the life of every single person in this room. It is a beauty and a grace and a wisdom and a faith, a deep abiding faith that all needs are met, that everything is working together for good right here and right now. It is an embracing of the goodness within each and every one of us that as I know that for myself, I know that for all people. And so it is from this place of oneness and unity of all things and all life that I declare and know for each one of us that there is a healing, that there is a transformation, that there is an up-leveling of consciousness within our own personal lives, breaking through any worries or fears or doubts or scarcity thinking, I know and accept for each one of us that we remember the truth of who we are, that we come back to what it is that we are about, the love, the beauty, the joy, the happiness, the peacefulness, the calm, And so I know this for every single one of us, that we are supported and guided and uplifted in every way. And so I claim it, I accept it, and I know it, and I know that all is well. I bless this community, I bless every single person who walked into this space, for I know that you were here for a purpose, on purpose. I bless this seaside community that serves as a light, as a vessel and a channel for wisdom and peace and love in so many ways, in so many ways in the community. And I bless this planet and the people who live on it. I bless this earth for what it provides for us. Coming back to knowing that we are one. We are one. And so giving thanks for this and so much more, I am just grateful. Grateful. Releasing my word into the law itself. It is done. And say together with me, and so it is. Ashe namaste.
I was a child Before life removed all the innocence My father would lift me high And dance with my mother and me And then spin me
Thanks, everyone. Happy Father's Day.